All right, we'll call the meeting to order. Uh, this meeting is being recorded. Um, I don't know if we, do we have the meeting, the minutes of 42517? Um, I think I did, did, did I not forward them to you? I don't think I had a copy. I didn't print out a copy or they have might, a copy. They might have, they didn't go out with the packet. Okay. But we'll just continue that till the next meeting. Okay. All right. Uh, public comment period. Do we have any public comment? Did yeah. Um, cool. So last Friday, you had a regular meeting scheduled. Yes. It was not noticed. It was not adjourned. It's a violation of the Brown Act. Cease and desist letter. Um, stating that you will no longer fail to notice regular meetings and post agendas within 72 hours prior, and you will no longer fail to adjourn or continue meetings that are scheduled but not held. And for <coughs> the federal board has. All right. Quorum of this board has it, so it's still public record, it says. So no. Uh, any other public comment? If not, uh, we'll go to item one. Uh, continue to discuss, design, and approve a format for a document to guide the work of the Formation Commission. The goal is to construct a document that assists the directors of the CSD to use the powers and procedures provided by the Community Service District Law to meet the diversity of the Isla Vista area, local conditions, circumstances, and its resources. Uh, see Government Code Section 6100 through 61250. So th this is the document that Will is currently working on yeah. under my direction. Um, and this might be a little on the spot, but do you have a little bit of an update you'd like yeah, to share? Yeah, so um, it's not complete yet, but there's a couple of um, points. The first being um, the, doc or the, the legislation says that there must be a budget proposed by July first, um, so that's the most upcoming deadline. A lot of the other stuff is about um, proper ways to hold elections, um, proper ways to redistrict, and uh, proper ways to notice <coughs> upcoming resolutions. Cool. That means you're becoming familiar with the law. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I, I think one of the, the ideas here is to just keep this on here as a working draft of an item when Will's ready to bring something forward, um, even with an outline or something. I think I've been trying to think of some columns that we might want to add to track progress and stuff. So um, I personally haven't had any time to forward ideas, you know, to the yeah, agenda. And, and, so, I, and I think that that's okay, given yep. given that Will serves under my direction. Yep. I think it's actually better that way the more that I've thought about it. Um, I can tell you the format of the assignment I gave him has um, uh, just a column for the, the specific piece of code, for the part, for the chapter, uh, a summary that's in one phrase, and then a longer summary that's one to two sentences of what the specific statute um, says or requires of us. Um, okay. And the, the, the specific things that are required, I asked him to highlight too. Okay. Are we keeping track of any action items, or are we keeping track of you know, the, this item was completed by the board at some certain date, or um, some the formation committee or the policy committee, or uh, no, that's not something that was in the assignment. But it can be something I think that once it's done, we can go back and add. Yeah. Can okay. Add those things. Cool. All right. Any other comments? Any public comment? All right. I think we can just. Uh, File this and continue it as, a, as an item. Um, number two, consider request for proposals for legal services approved and returned to the Board of Directors for final approval prior to its release. Uh, a is discuss and consider a proposal for legal services by an individual or firm to assist the district as general co legal counsel and provide assistance to the district during its startup over the first year. Uh, see Government Code Section 61060. And then B is begin work on a long-term request for proposal for general legal counsel services in order to provide day-to-day -day legal advice to the district board of directors and its staff. See government code section uh, 
61060G. And then along with the um, agenda, there was a uh, attachment that uh, Director Brandt prepared that um, really is uh, using a, a, a proposal for legal services by another district. And he um, worked that into a, um, a draft proposal that we can use as an outline to maybe uh, finish up this work and forward it or decide what to do. So I had a few thoughts on this. The way that I agendized this, a couple of things I was thinking about. One is long term, you know, we want to have general legal services. And the question gets to be in the long term, how would we, if, if we had money, um, I think the amount of legal services we have is determined by the services we're delivering. Um, and so therefore, maybe that's just a draft document of, you know, if, if we had money in a couple of years and we were formally going to propose and hire somebody, well, what would we want that person to do at that point in time, <coughs> you know, for the, the year following that? What, what, if we had a full-blown attorney and we had money to pay for it? Then the second thing is, is A was, well, what do we want to do in the interim? And of course, we're all thinking about going out and get somebody to work for us pro bono, or my thought was is if we could fundraise enough, we could at least give somebody a $5,000 you know, stipend of some sort. Because one of the things that will come up later in the agenda is uh, I inquired about um, whether if we got a um, general liability policy for our board members, or could we include these potential independent contractors of general manager and um, legal counsel? And the answer there was no, since they're independent contractors, we couldn't buy them insurance. So that, might, that would mean that we would have to provide them with some kind of money Either they have their own insurance because they're in a firm, or if they're just someone like me retired, they would have to go to the expense of getting a million dollar policy, which is standard. I did look at someone's um, how much that cost that individual for a different district, and it was about $1,200 to buy a million dollars worth of coverage for someone in the business of getting legal counsel. So it's not you know, somebody pro bono coming to work for us is going to have some expense, but maybe they'd want to contribute $1,200, I don't know. So the question then gets to be for me is, how do we solicit that pro bono thing? Do we do it like Spencer has here and say, we're going to ask you to do these limited number of things? Or would we really just put out a request for a proposal for someone to serve and have them tell us what they would do for us. And therefore, you know, we have this outline of what we think the legal services should be, but we're really hiring this attorney to kind of come in and tell us, well, what do you think we, what do you think we need? Because that's how I found this insurance advisor telling me it was her recommendations to me, not me saying, because I did, didn't have enough understanding. So I don't, I don't know what you guys think about that. Can, well, can I ask Claire a funny question real quick? The $1,200 was per month or per a year? Per, per an annual. Per annual. year, okay. Yeah, well, I will say that in the, the draft that I wrote up, that's one of the, I brought the most extensive RFP that I could find to the board for the purposes of <laughs> showing what a, a full-on RFP would look like would look like and then from that I started crossing things out in this draft that I brought back here to try to narrow the scope so that we weren't asking because with that we'd be asking someone to be our legal counsel for free basically um, right and um, there are a lot of things in there like um, come to every single meeting and advise us at the meetings that's not something that we're going to be able to get someone to do so we I have seen RFPs that are more open-ended and that would would leave room for someone to really <coughs> write their own
proposal rather than um, adhering to this kind of rigid structure that's in here. Um, if I, I think it'd, it'd be great to consider something like that. The real question is, um, I think to me, is how to how to get this stuff for free. Right. So and I, I didn't know if it would help some attorney out there. Let's say we said when we have money, here would be the full-blown legal services. And if we didn't have money, what do you think we should do? Yeah, I don't think we should ever allow those two to cross. Cross. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, and second of all, I would say we should not cross the bridge of creating um, a position. And I think the same for our next agenda item. I think we'll get slammed on that because who they are, they haven't even done anything yet, and they, but they've already got two big high paid positions that they're all ready to go with. Right. I, I, I think we should focus on the pro bono. What I would suggest is that we write a letter to the Santa Barbara County Bar Association, which has a whole pro bono program, and ask them if they could assist us and uh, if they could solicit and just assist us, which right. might mean soliciting some of their members to see if there is an attorney out there that would be interested in doing pro bono work for us. And, and, and I, I think, think what we're looking yeah. for is a relatively young attorney, somewhat fresh out of law school, who's looking to have an internship in government and so I do think that then that we probably would come back to the part where we're going to have to indemnify them. Right. So could I suggest that we do that? That we send a letter? What do you think about it? Sending a letter to the local bar association, citing their pro bono program. And and then would we just simply request that we want somebody to come and act as general legal counsel, which I think in its general legal counsel and a lot of contracts I looked at, yeah. the attorneys know what that means. They're generally advising yeah. the district. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I guess what the first thing is, I would just want to get a conversation going with lawyers. Right. Where they would come back to us and say, here's the outline of our pro bono program. Here's how it works. Here's how we do well. And or they come back and say, you guys are nuts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. So we would be asking the Bar Association for advice on drafting an RFP, or we would be asking them for people who are interested in serving? I think we're asking them for help in finding a pro bono attorney mm -hmm. that could help us in the early days of our self-government experiment and do, do you think we want to include any you know I'm reading from a different agreement where when you're going out for general counsel at least for this district I'm looking at which is a government district they ask for a clear understanding and experience dealing with and representing public bodies in the state of California and b a thorough knowledge or ability to acquire not to acquire knowledge of the California government code and community district codes applicable, or the government codes applicable to the district, and specific knowledge of the Ralph M. Brown Act and Public Records Act. I mean, are those the kinds of things that we want to throw out there? That well, we might want to. We want. We might not. I mean, and that's a three hundred dollar an hour attorney. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That you just described. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I mean, I. I, I think we're going to, I mean, here's the other thing. So don't put any restrictions on it that they have prior government experience. We just want somebody tr trained in the legal aspects. Right. And, has a, and we're going to train them on government. Mm -hmm. well, or vice versa <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> yeah. here's, here's the other thing is that if we're, we're entering into a contract with someone, yeah. and I'm not entirely sure because I'm not up to speed on the like contract sections of the code but we might need to have there are most likely requirements for it well uh, for but then the well, process. I thought where you were going was then we need to get another attorney to help us draft the oh, contract for oh, this God, attorney no. oh, God, and, no. 
Uh, and yeah. then who's going to renew the contract that we enter into? I mean, I, I just think we have to be try and keep things as simple as we can. Um, yeah. You're really asking somebody to come as general legal counsel, and then when you enter into a contract with them, it's kind of a two-way street. They're going to make a proposal to you about what they can do with their experience, and we can make a proposal to them then about well, what right. what we right. want them to do in right. these broad sections of right. knowledge. Right. Mm -hmm. But I still think at some point we're going to end up having to obtain insurance for them. I think we could. Do, I think I think as it was explained to me that we could pay them a stipend where they buy their own insurance. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think that that would be how it would work as well. Um, Yeah, I, I, I just think we need, because I just have a, a little bit of concern, like I said, not being completely understanding of how, what the requirements are in the code for us to, for like, legal counsel? Are, are, well, no, I'm saying, are we, are we allowed to go to a specific organization and say, can you help us out with this one specific service and then enter into a contract kind of. Sure. Seems to me, I mean, what we can go to anybody, I mean, we as a government agency, agency can go to anybody and say, would you be willing to provide services to us? Yeah, I think under 61060 mm -hmm. that we have the authority to hire professional mm -hmm. professionals or independent contractors. Um, and. Uh, you know, the insurer that I was talking to yesterday it wasn't an insurer, it was just a representative of the Special Districts Association, was, was right on point about saying, well, if you want to hire an independent contractor, you have the ability to hire an independent contractor, and that's probably what you want to do on formation. Okay. That you, you probably aren't ready for employees, mm -hmm. which I agree, we're not yeah, ready for employees. Yeah. And then once you get ready for employees, then that kicks in a whole bunch of other insurance requirements that mm -hmm. we need to get right. into. Right. So right. that's where that's right. Right. our side of insuring ourselves explodes. Workers come. Yep. Employment law, all those types of things. Mm -hmm. So the question then gets to be, how should we put together this um, letter? letter that I guess we want to take it to our full board mm -hmm. and have our full board support this request. Right. right. So one of us drafts it, mm -hmm. keeps it simple. Do we want to uh, draft it and try and consider it ourselves at our next formation committee meeting, which is only a, not very far away? I mean, I think it's okay to take it to the full board. Just just get it and take it to the full board. So I'm going to write a couple of paragraphs. And it really what it does is mm -hmm. starts the conversation. I, what I'm hoping is we're going to get educated then that somebody in the Bar Association is going to come to us and say, here's how it kind of works. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you want pro bono, here's how that works. Because we, we encourage attorneys. I mean, there are things to encourage attorneys to provide pro bono work. Right. So here's kind of the outlines of, you know. So I, I see us being a ways away from an agreement or, mm -hmm. or retaining somebody. Mm -hmm. And again, I informally talk to a several alums who are retired attorneys who live in Santa Barbara. They're not interested. Not at all. They're good-hearted, they're progressive, they don't, but they do not see... They don't want to practice. <laughs> I mean, listen, they see it as a very, very controversial job in which they're going to... Uh, there's no upside. Right. There's just a downside. Which is why we've got to get a young person right. who's interested in learning and... So does someone want to take a stab at drafting it? Mm -hmm. George, do you want to? I'm happy to do it. Okay. I always like to defer to Spencer because he's a wordsmith. Or we can have our intern draft. Uh, no, I, think, I think it's better if it comes out of the community. Right. Okay, so then what I'll do is my to-do here is to draft it and have it to you 
um, all. Is that the process? Draft a draft. You would draft it, and then you would send it to the secretary who would uh, attach it. Agendize it. Would agendize. Would you guys want to see it first? I think to see it, we'd have to put it in a notice in a committee. All right. The well, then I'll let me draft it, and if um, and yeah. I think I have a good sense of. Well, where should we give him some criteria for um, what it is? Um, I think they should have a motion. Um, I'm trying to think of what the motion would have. Well, um, move to why don't you just informally tell me what you think it should have? I mean, it clearly it should describe the district in one well, paragraph. I think it should be pro bono mm -hmm. to provide general legal counsel mm -hmm. to um, enter into a independent contract with the district and part of that is to establish um, what legal services they'll provide mm -hmm. and include some background about the district too right it can be right. brief but in my like for example yeah, Spencer I've, got, I've got a bunch yeah, of I saw that I saw, I saw that in your draft okay, okay. I'll do that and then I will send it to you to agendize for the board meeting Tuesday. When do you need that? Uh, the By deadline to submit things is five days before the board meeting. So that would be on what, Thurs Thursday. Five business Thurs days? Thursday. Five business Thursday. days or yeah. five days? It's five days. Okay. So at the very Every least... Every day is a business day for me. Okay. So five... So you need... Into business tomorrow. And if that's mm. not doable, then we we could do it the other way and bring it back to this committee, finalize it, and do just you feel more comfortable doing that. I don't know if you feel more comfortable getting more input that way. Well, what's going to happen is we're going to have a discussion with the full board, which is always good. And if they we can do it there, yeah. And then if they mm -hmm. want to send it back to committee, yes, yeah, we'll that's let cool. Them send Perfect. It back. Yep. And, I agree. Okay. All right, so we're going to, our motion is to direct. Yeah, I'll, I'll make a motion. Uh, I don't have that sheet of paper in front of me of what we just all agree to, but. Um, well, that's right, I'll make the motion. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, uh, that we would direct myself to draft a letter to the Santa Barbara County Bar Association um, soliciting their assistance in obtaining a pro bono attorney to provide general legal counsel to the district. I'll second. Before we vote, we want to take public comment. Public comment? Did you hand up earlier? Um. Yeah, I don't remember what that was about. At this point, I'm just kind of sitting here like, I sincerely doubt that you will find a young attorney saddled with tons of law school debt that is willing to take on an internship. But Are you volunteering? Yeah. Oh, I'm not an attorney. <laughs> <laughs> My question is, if this doesn't work out um, with like an alternative, like I was thinking like a press release, like maybe posted in the independent, just you know, maybe draw up some hype that this is the yeah. for this that might reach someone in Santa Barbara. Yeah, well, I, th I think that the alternative would just be to have a, if this does not end up working out, would have an RFP that's a lot more uh, abstract than the one that I brought that's narrowed down that scope of services um, or just left it open-ended where they can bring it back to us. Right. And then I think we're all more than capable of doing the publicity tour to get that thing in as many hands as possible. Um, and to uh, a press release would be good. Um, 
I'm trying to think of w what other kinds of outreach we would do. Go, we go to meetings. I know there are all kinds. There's the Bar Association. There's Santa Barbara Women Lawyers. Um, there, I would imagine there's other associations that may be interested in something like this. And it could be an individual or a firm, because I, I understand <coughs> that there are some firms that do pro bono work to generate future business or whatever. Mm -hmm. That they might have that young person that is inexperienced that they want to send them out to get some experience. I know, I know the district attorney does that a lot with um, her organization. Of course, then they have attorneys supervising other attorneys, so it works a little bit better. That's why a firm might do it, because they get some supervision mm -hmm. from that firm. So the motion is to direct Director Thurlow to draft a letter to the Santa Barbara County Bar Association soliciting their assistance in attaining pro bono in attaining a pro bono attorney to provide general legal counsel to the district. Uh, I'm going to add uh, and bring that letter to the uh, full board. Is that friendly? Mm -hmm. Yes. You guys smile out there. Don't be so stoic. <laughs> uh, I, I guess I can offer a comment. My name is Ross Trindle, T-R-I-N-D-L-E. I'm actually from uh, a law firm that represents uh, public entities. I'm a UCSB uh, alumni, a graduate in 99. Uh, I was here uh, at the invitation of uh, Mr. Brandt. Uh, in your, your quest, I would maybe suggest that you're <coughs> narrowing your focus a little bit too much to the Santa Barbara uh, Bar Association. You can also look at the League of California Cities. A lot of the law firms that represent municipal entities also represent special districts, water districts. The, uh, there is a statewide organization of special districts. If you look at some of their promotional materials, their uh, yearly or, uh, or quarterly meetings, you'll see the sponsors of law firms that represent those types of districts. It might be a way to very easily cash in that a little bit more uh, broadly so that you don't necessarily run into find a pool of potential candidates and just you might have more success doing that. Cool. Great input. Thanks. I totally forgot you were coming. That's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see you here. Thank you for coming. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Jonathan? You know, one other thought that this just popped to mind too. I know UCLA Law School has a public law department under it, which is like law about government and public agencies. But I don't know what the rules and relationships are like with a university, especially with the UC, since we have a relationship with a different UC here. But UCLA could be, like, it's not that far away. Like, Los Angeles is not that far away if they if we found someone through there, too. Yeah. Because well, they have a whole department on this type of law. And I don't anticipate us needing to have this person here in person for the board meetings. No. Yeah. That would seem excessive to me. They come like once in a while. And you guys can write questions and send to them or something. Yeah, because I know in conversations I've had, people have brought up, um, I think it was um, it was Shane Stark, he said, oh, well, you should reach out to the, the Santa Clara, something in Santa Clara County. And I said, Santa Clara County, that's nowhere near us. And he said, well, you're not going to need them in physical proximity to you at all times, maybe once in a while. But um, so, yeah, that's seems like it could be an option as well. I mean, what do we think? Do we think we're limiting it too much by only going to this one organization? Well, my thought there is that they're kind of the big dog in town. They have an ongoing pro bono problem. It's mostly just to, to test the waters. I mean, I agree that there's other organizations, um, and that prompted me. I know somebody in the that does work for the League of California City said I'm just going to be meeting with him. Let me ask <coughs> him. Um, but I just thought this would this was a start of a process mm -hmm. as opposed to yeah. And the other piece to remember, based on what we were just talking about, is the selection of an attorney. If we have the bar association kind of give their stamp of approval, that's one thing. If we just open this up and yeah. essentially let any and all attorneys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then we're going to have to have a selection process, or we're going to have to have people who are going to 
you know, vet these people. And yeah. Versus you have the Bar Association, which has an established pro bono list, and you assume that they're going to... Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, once we go into a selection process, then that's the point where we need someone to help us, an attorney to sit at the table with us and help us with that. Yeah. I don't want that to just be us or the board working on that. Um, so you're right, it, it would complicate things. But, I mean, it, yeah, within this letter, I imagine this is something that um, if we, if we want to include other organizations, that wouldn't seem like a problem to me. Um, we just sent it out, sent yeah. the same letter out. Yeah. yeah. Just one other observation on this when we get the attorney. One, I think we should do a little bit of research about you know, how much do special districts spend on legal representation? Because I know sometimes some districts, and I would imagine Ivy Rec and Park District, spends a minimal amount of money of their budget on legal services. Right. Somebody and told us that. It was like $12,000 a year. Be, yeah. Something and like then that. you get other districts that are highly, that, that have like people. You mean the Galita West Sanitary District? I, I didn't say, I don't know how much Galita West spends, but you know, a lot. when you get to, to the bigger districts and the more complicated districts, then they not only have um, general legal counsel, they have special counsel. And you know, you get someone like Galita Water that got into Slippery Rock, um, and you know, they're hiring $1,000 a, a year attorneys. And so I think we really should look at some of the other special districts around, maybe our community services districts who, who are into some complicated stuff like water and sewer, and just see what, what should be our expectation in future budgets about how much we should try and spend on legal services. Because you can spend a lot and cover yourselves and have somebody at every single meeting, but then you, I don't know if you can afford that. And I think our motto should be we want to provide more money to direct services than indirect services. Your first comment about we don't need a high paid general manager and high paid legal counsel to deliver a million dollars worth of service. So, mm -hmm. and I yeah. see the headline New District spends all their money on lawyers. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah, no, we don't want to get into yeah. those situations. Yeah. And I looked up what IBRPD spent. This is the budget from 14 15 because I can't find a newer one. but. Um, they spent thirty-five thousand dollars in that year for legal services, and you could you could think they probably spend a lot if they're going out to mail this mail ballot. Probably cost them quite a bit of money to get that on. Yeah, well, they def definitely had to have a lawyer look over their yeah. ballot measure. Right. So at the very least, right. Okay, so we got a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. We'll go to item three. The, the other comment I had, you know, as we work through our agenda, if we don't get this whole agenda done, I just suggest we continue it to future meetings. And, um, right. you know, some of this is coming through, um, you know, getting referred back to us by our board of directors. We try and get it on here quick. And that doesn't mean we did all enough district staff work to have a good item. So the next one is consider request for proposals for a general manager approve and return to the board of directors for final approval prior to its release. Discuss and consider a proposal to seek an individual to assist the district as general manager and provide assistance to the district during its startup over the first year. See government code section 61060. And then begin work on a long-term job description for a general manager in order to provide day-to-day -day management of the district and its staff. See Government Code Section 61050 through 61053. So for this one, I was thinking the same way. Do we want to look at what a general manager would do for us? You know, if we could afford a full-time general manager to kind of provide us with some roadmap to say, well, if we hired a general manager pro bono or with a small stipend, you know, what are the essential things we'd want them to do? You know, 
and do we want to do the longer term thing to help us with the shorter term or should we just jump to the shorter term like we did with legal and make a determin determination right now about what are those essential short term things that a general manager working part time for us could really help us out to, um, you know, be the staff person that we could talk to when we want to cancel a meeting or do, you know, things of that nature yeah. or make sure that we collect the $500 pledge that um, IVCDC has given us and how, how do we coordinate that process of did that deposit get done and th those kinds of things. So I don't know if we have a simple laundry list of those duties. I know uh, Spencer sent out another um, document that really was, yeah. um, yeah, which one it was? Didn't you send out something? Yeah, it was the attachment B. So I'll kind of give a brief overview of that, but I'll first say that I think you hit it right on the head. The first thing that we would need a GM to do would be this operational stuff in terms of preparing documents, um, uh, helping prepare, um, helping prepare agendas, things like that. Um, the document that I have is um, an independent contractor agreement. Uh, between something called the Silver Creek Valley Country Club Geological Abatement District uh, and a independent contractor GM. So um, this is something I found on the California Special Districts Association website. Um, and it sounds like uh, from this contract, if you read it, it sounds like they had appointed this person previously to be their general manager and then had desired to enter into a contract uh, and so they wrote up this agreement. Um, they have um, all, all, all of the, the things that you'd expect in a contract. The big thing that I was focusing on, though, is that um, the, in terms of uh, how much the hourly rate is that this person is, it's just zero dollars per hour. Um, and I was really happy to see that because that showed me that there's a big precedent for having someone work for you for free in this role, um, but also still be entered into a legal agreement with them. Um, so this specific um, district is a geological abatement district. I never even heard of one of those. What is um, it? It's a geological abatement. Is a geological hazard abatement district? It's something that is chartered by the Public Resources Code and it, it, it has a board of directors. Um, it, this specific one is in uh, the city of San Jose. Um, and aside from that, I don't know a whole a lot of information about mm -hmm. what it is. Um, so this is more of a contract rather than a job description. It, yeah. So which mm -hmm. I think it's, it's, it's a real great template mm -hmm. for if we were to enter into a contract with a free employee. Well, I'll just, I'll just play attorney a minute. Yeah. And I would say that when you write an independent contractor agreement to act and perform the services of the general manager of the G head in such capacity to manage and direct the day-to-day -day operations of the G head and perform others, such other services the board may from time to time designate, that's a no-no. Meaning that, that he's not really an independent he's, he's not, not really, really an independent, independent contractor. contractor so if you if you dive in and get the in uh, if you get the um, IRS 20 point checklist about what a true independent contractor is you'd want to avoid language like this we <coughs> in getting an independent contractor just like the attorney it's really the attorney telling us what to do and it's this general manager coming in and operating independently with knowledge and ability to tell us what to do. I mean, you can put these general directions in here about... I think you've touched on something that's real important, which is I'm not sure you can have a general... I'm not sure you can have an independent contractor serve in, in that kind of a role. Yeah, I, I can... I, I, I've seen it before, and I think they... The, it, it happens. 
I think that, you know, the, just the person I was talking to yesterday, we'll get in later on this insurance thing, she was telling me the same thing. Well, you can tell them in general what to do. You can set their expectations that you're going to go in there and help us with, you know, making sure we're canceling and putting up meetings on time. We want you to understand the Brown Act and help us comply with the Brown Act. We want you to help us make sure that, you know, we did the, the you know, we did the deposits of money that were organized to do a budget. I think it's just someone coming in at an extra 20 hours helping us on the day-to-day -day management of the district, but them kind of guiding us at the same time that they come in with some form of guidance of what a general manager would do. And I can think of a couple of people that could that might be willing, you know, I saw him show up on the formation night and say, oh, I know that person's retired. He might put in 20 hours a week and come help us fill that void of day-to-day, -day, keeping things going day-to-day. -day. It's just another, to me, another 20 hours of work by somebody, or 10, <laughs> or, you know, five more than I usually have. But I, I don't know, I see the other side. We have to be really careful that this person is not an employee of ours. Because mm -hmm. then we get into a whole different world. So in, in that specific line that you had read off, the no-no is services that the board, or to basically do anything that the board directs them to do from time to time, or designates them to do? I think to manage and direct the day-to-day -day operations Got to be a little bit careful there when you get to day to day, and I think you got to be careful that they perform other services that the board may direct. Yeah, you just got to be really careful that when you read the IRS guidelines and start testing that stuff, you you it wouldn't be a person that let's say if we had a physical space that they went in and ran the office day to day, mm -hmm. that they ran the intern program, mm -hmm. that they um, you know, they didn't have a separate mailing address for themselves, that their work site has to be independent. They, they come and go, they set their hours, they, mm -hmm. they, they just work in a general capacity and, you know, help provide services where necessary. Mm -hmm. it's, it, well, maybe this is something that we should reach out to CSDA about because this was uh, the the place that I got this from was their sample document library, and it was among the, one of I think a couple different contracts for general managers. So in order for them to place it on there, I would like to think that it would have been vetted, but who knows? Um, right. That certainly sounds like it's questionable. Uh, but there also is an appendix in here uh, that lists the description of services. Yeah, that I saw GM that. GM will right. perform. So it's prepare all necessary worked product necessary for regular and special GHAT board of directors meetings as follows, board packages in advance of meetings, uh, post notices, orchestrate, attend, and provide support for board meetings, record minutes of board meetings and post notices, um, administer financial aspects of the district, uh, such as record keeping, um, paying the expenses, uh, implementing investment policies is one of them, setting budgets, um, oversee uh, field activities, uh, they have oversee basically the services that they're provided or pr providing. Um, so, um, and also record keeping. Yeah, is that so, the job description right there? Those, those are the scope of services. So when I look at that scope of services, it just, that I read this before I went back and read that mm -hmm. opening paragraph, and I say from my experience, that's an employee. Mm -hmm. That we that that wouldn't be how I would I would write this broad concept of how they would come in and maybe um, assist with the scheduling of regular and special meetings, or that wouldn't be administer all financial aspects of the JAD. It would be um, uh, assure that you know the financial record keep records are being posted promptly or something. Um, 
he could they could have a role in that. They could mm -hmm. they could be one of the approvers or preparers, you know. Um, you know, to oversee the field activities of consultants, that, that, that might be okay. And then, but to maintain archives and records on a day-to-day -day basis, I say that's an employee. So, you know, you're doing that, and I don't think we'd want the general manager to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we want the general manager to come in and do some high-level stuff to keep us all going and to take up mm -hmm. some of the slack or maybe it would even be help us write some staff reports. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well that's certainly something that I would want. Yeah, somebody that's skilled at writing staff reports. So I, I don't know. So how do we move this agenda item forward? You know, if, if we're all in agree, if we're in agreement with the general approach, I could take another shot for the next meeting about what we would want for a scope of services because mm -hmm. I, I got it I got Spencer's and I got a couple of more um, independent contractor or, or general manager job descriptions that I think I could mm -hmm. I could work through mm -hmm. yeah I, I think that would be great I, I just want to make sure that we have one of the reasons I was happy to see the contract is because I know then there's a template for us to be able to uh, have those things distilled into something that's a legal document. Yeah, let, because let, given that we don't have an attorney right now, let me pull a couple of a independent of contractor. We we've gone through. I went through at the County of Santa Barbara in 1991 with Deloitte and Touche, and we had numerous independent contractors that where we were employees, and we went through a huge effort at the county to convert all those independent contractors to employees and then putting guidelines about you know meeting the the strict construction of the code and it was doctors and psychiatrists and and I think we I think I have some good material that I could come back with something it's something I would commit that I give it a shot for the next meeting yeah I, okay I, I think that sounds great okay, I'll make a motion then, okay. um, Director Guys, prepare a scope of services uh, document for a general manager, district general manager, and then he brings that back to the next. As an independent contractor, friendly amendment. Sure. Okay. Unless you find, I mean, unless you <coughs> get there and you do, in your course of your research, you find out, you know what. Because a little bit of what you're saying to me right now makes me a little bit nervous about doing this as an independent contract. Yeah. So so let me try it, and then you guys push back. Okay. And say, okay, it can't be done. Mistake. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think we should all take a look at the IRS definition of what an employee is versus we, what. We in my previous life we looked at that a lot. <laughs> okay. okay. I mean, it has to do with interns. That's where you get, that's where you get burned. Because mm -hmm. the IRS says, I mean, you know, California. That's the other thing is California labor law essentially mm -hmm. says you can't use interns for regular jobs mm -hmm. that uh, that you have other people doing mm -hmm. paid. But the other piece is, yeah the independent contractor thing. In our business, it was, it was newspaper delivery guys mm -hmm. and gals. And we all kind of called them independent contractors, but we told them exactly where to take the newspapers, right? and that's where it all fell apart. Because you're essentially directing them. They don't have any, they can't just throw them anywhere. Right. <laughs> <laughs> or deliver them in the method and manner that they want. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. Okay. So, so, so it, it's a, it's a tricky business looking at the IRS code stuff. But, yeah, you know, it it it's a really a, a big, um, it, it's a it's a it's a big judgment. There's a lot. There's some judgment in there, but there are guidelines that we can pull together. Okay. So I'll restate the motion. The motion is for director guys to prepare a scope of services document for a district general manager as an independent contractor. It, you, yeah, I'll, I'll second. I'll give you another good example that I've had in. So there's a guy cutting the grass at the cemetery. 
is the independent contractor, if he comes there, takes the lawnmower out of the cemetery district closet and goes cuts the grass and says, I'm an independent contractor. No. But yeah. if he brings his own equipment in there and he unloads it at the driveway yeah. and he cuts the grass, he's yeah. an independent contractor. So you gotta you gotta kinda throw those real simple tests out when you eventually get to whatever I write up and say, Well, that doesn't meet the simple test. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Good. All right, Do we need all of uh, public comment? Anybody? Anyone want to volunteer? <laughs> all in favor? Aye. 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 All right, number four is um, discuss the process to solicit information from the Special District Risk Management Authority and a presentation by the authority in order to assess the insurance needs of the district. Uh, consider solicitation from other providers in order to file applications for competitive pricing and services. So I got around yesterday to a phone call with the Special District Risk Management Authority. I was lucky and got uh, Ellen Doherty, it's D-O-U-G-H-T-Y, and she is the chief of member services, which means I got to somebody that, and this is with the Special Dis Risk Management Authority, not the Special Districts Association. Mm -hmm. She was very, um, I want to say, nice, educational, respectful, um, and um, I thought she gave me some good advice. One of the things I asked her, I said, could you call in at this meeting and give my board of directors, or our formation committee, that same advice? And she said that they, as the Special District Risk Management Authority, are not an insurance provider. They kind of pool insurance together and provide three basic programs. Their programs are, they bundle liability, property, and casualty insurance programs. So therefore, let's say if you own a building or you want um, coverage for our board or you want general liability for the particular business you're in, then they would bundle those services. When I read the eight services to her, she got really, um, goosey about when we talked about supplemental law enforcement services. Oh, if you're doing that, we definitely don't do law enforcement contracts. That's a whole different insurance pool. And I go, oh, well, we're really not going to do that. We may finance that. And the university or the county would take the liability on delivering law enforcement. She says, well, that's, that's a different arrangement. And I better understand it. But they also provide workers comp programs and they provide health benefit programs. So um, that's the three things they do. Um, she said that if we put in an application to them, that they probably wouldn't be able to underwrite our services because they're too unknown. We haven't, we haven't entered into any service arrangements, so therefore an underwriter wouldn't know what to insure. And she said that, um, she couldn't give me formal guidance, training or guidance on insurance because they aren't a licensed insurance provide agent. And so therefore, if we want to get insured, if we want to say, hey, we want to be insured for this, we need to be talking to an insurance company or someone licensed to sell insurance um, because of all the requirements around providing insurance. She did say that um, because we were a um, new board that what she thought she was really surprised we were having meetings already without errors and omission coverage for the governing board and so that's the first thing she says well what you're really doing is you're a governing board that that's your exposure you're providing services and um, you need errors and omissions coverage which is a form of general liability coverage but they specifically on the special district risk management authority if they brokered that on our behalf they would be going to alliant which is the same insurer for uh errors risks uh, for general liability that the county was directing me to in fact this organization um, has a relationship with csac 
the same as the county. They use CSAC for their excess insurance coverage, and they use Alliant for services like errors and omissions. Um, she did suggest that we submit applications for errors and omissions coverage for the governing board. To, um, whom, to whom? To her or to Alliant? To Alliant. Okay. And then that's the same, that's the same um, general direction I got from the county's risk manager. And then she said she could not extend coverage to independent contractors such as legal counsel and a general manager, if they're truly independent. And then as to other uh, liability insurance, she said until a district like ours was able to measure our exposure, they most likely would not underwrite other insurance company uh, coverage. They need to be able to understand when someone could cause damage. And since we're not doing anything, they don't know who how to how to assess that and therefore you you don't know what an insurance company is not going to give right. you insurance if they don't know what they're insuring um, and then she followed that up with well usually you need an analysis with legal counsel and a risk manager <laughs> of course of course so it's, it's this never-ending circle <laughs> it's a it's it's really you want to get somebody that that you know, understands insurance like me talking to Ray Armatero over at the county who understood the various coverages off the top of his head and said, well, you don't need all this stuff. You only need, he said, general liability insurance, but I'm not sure if that got around to when we filled out the application if we wouldn't end up with just errors and omission. So, so um, can we move this forward by essentially asking Alliant to to make a, do we need to have an RFP process here to have Alliant at least make a proposal for coverage? I, th I think what Ray Armaterio did for me is he sent me the application for Alliant and then it's up to us to fill out the application so they can figure out what, they're what, covering. what our coverage is, and I could put in a call to Alliant, that was going to be my next step, of saying, hey, could you make a presentation to us about insurance but services so we better understood this? That's what I was thinking the next step would be, is to have Alliant come and educate the board, the full board, about... Mm -hmm. Okay. Because I don't... So I'll make a motion that we ask um, Alliant to come to the next potential board meeting to make a presentation about potential insurance coverage. our regular board meeting yeah okay I mean again insurance is something that I think the full board yeah needs to hear directly right and um, and then the next step would be an application is to do the application right yeah but I don't quite understand so if a client is the carrier um, what does this risk man? What what? So the so for li so like for liability property, mm -hmm. they they broker that out and coordinate all those carriers for the different kinds of coverages you need. They could do that for us. They would just if they were only going to represent us, they would just do alliant for errors and omissions. But she said you would you eventually you might want to go to their okay and, to their and she's going to send me her brochure that I can okay. forward to everyone okay. so that we have a better understanding about what all those insurance where we need to insure ourselves if right you know as we start to do service if we start handling money mm -hmm. if we started to manage these buildings. Um, right. So with that, any public comment? Okay, so you're gonna refer this to back to me for me to contact Alliant. Sure, okay. yeah. but so letting the secretary know that we'd like to have this as, as an agenda. agenda. I'd like to have them provide the training at, at, to us and uh, yeah. Yeah, so the Gu motion. And guidance on insurance. The motion is to ask Alliant to come to the next regular board meeting and present about potential insurance options. I don't know if we'll get them at the next. Um, and that was what how about at a regularly scheduled? Insurance. How about a regularly scheduled board meeting? Okay, yeah. I'm going to second the motion, and that's friendly with me. I think their insurance guys are hungry. 
and gals. They're hungry. Though. I don't know if a lion is. <laughs> No. No. <laughs> no, they're not hungry. <laughs> they're like the California State Workers Comp. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the motion is to ask a line to come to a regular board meeting and present about potential insurance options. Yeah. And that, what, a regular scheduled board meeting, you said, right? Uh, yeah, well, they're called regular meetings, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, public comment? Call for the question. Aye. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, the next one was uh, referred to as back by the board and considered devising a work plan to expand the district intern program, return to the board of directors with the work plan in order to be prepared for the summer quarter at UCSB and potentially Santa Barbara Community College and notice Director Thurlow um, left the room. Uh, see government code section 61060. It's hard to just see Jay back there, so stoic. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry, I was right there. Yeah. Which number is this? Sorry, I'm lost. Uh, five. Agenda. It's five, okay. So, for, for the next steps for this, um, I think that the want was for us to reach out to Santa Barbara City College and see if we can extend the internship program to them in order to be able to have a similar arrangement like we have now um, with the interns with UCSB. Um, but another component of this is, do we want to expand the amount of interns that UCSB is contributing as well? Right. Um, I know that informally I've had people express interests, other uh, groups express interests, such as associated students, in terms of contributing more to that program to hire more interns. Um, talking about interns now. Do I need to be here or can I go take a smoke break? Uh, that, I think that's up to you. I announced that you left the room and I'll announce that Director Thurlow returned. I think this is a I think Spencer was just. Um, let, let me. I, I think the two of you can handle this. Okay. So let me just step out of the room. Okay. Just wave at me. Okay. I'll we'll make it quick. Talk. Yeah. I'll be out talking to the ducks. So, Spencer, I think you brought up two good points Santa Barbara Community College expanding the intern. And the last thing I, I heard on the work plan was could we, as the formation committee, address, well, if we expanded it, what would those great projects be that we would have the interns work on so that so that we know that we had the capacity to give the interns a great learning experience so i didn't know how we wanted to tackle that mm -hmm. you know one of my thoughts were on that well we have eight services we'll have the interns do a project on each one of those services. Mm -hmm. What would it take to, mm -hmm. what, what's their, what, what, what's, how do we mentor them to get through that service and say what it is, how could we deliver it, what's the short-term goal, what's the long-term goal? Um, I don't know, uh, that was one idea I had that said, well, there's eight projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think that would be really interesting, having the interns have a, like a, I mean, I think in a lot of ways it'd be a quarter long project if we wanted it to be really extensive right. about finding out what the feasibility of this district providing those services would be and not just in terms of going in and, and reviewing documents that are online but also going and, and, and talking to people and finding out um, what, um, not representing the district, but finding out what it would take for right. the district to be able to do something like that and then making those presentations to the board. Right. And then we could even have, on some of the bigger services, we could even assi assign maybe a two-person intern team. I think if mm -hmm. you get over to supplemental law enforcement, mm -hmm. that's just a, like a huge issue. Yeah. And, and there's so many directions. That's such a broad service. Right. I know I have a million different ideas for what that could be. Right. I know the whole board has a million different ideas yeah. for what that could be. Um, and in terms of providing 
services that are that are focused, there are, um, I imagine that interns would have a bunch of different ideas too. Right. So, whereas something like graffiti abatement, that seems like if I were the intern assigned to do that project, that seems like it would be a pretty easy project. Just go review IBRPD's budget, uh, go talk to Rodney over at RPD and um, find out what uh, sort of methods and equipment they're using to abate graffiti are, how often graffiti abatement happens, um, where that program's money is coming from. I mean, that seems like a piece of cake. I can get that done in a week. Yeah. So um, the same thing with maybe the mediation program is what is the mediation program? But when you get to the mediation program, then that involves involves the county board of supervisors and a process to go back to the board of supervisors and is probably you know the mediation program yeah. or are you talking about the uh, advisory the council? municipal advisory council? I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So I don't know. I, I do. You guys have any other ideas? And I see the public wants to give some comments, but. Mm -hmm. Um, we'll go to public comment That's and then before Gabriel forgets. Uh, yeah, I won't forget this one. Uh, for the past two weeks, I've actually been trying to get the entirety of your board to look at the fact that your interns might actually be employees. And um, talking about services is actually making me really nervous because that defining line, whether they're designated employees or not, essentially comes down to the fact that uh, whether or not they have some sort of, uh, I can read the law for you actually, that's a better idea because I'm not a lawyer. <coughs> so section 82032 of the Political Reform Act states um, that influencing legislative or administrative action means promoting, supporting, influencing, modifying, opposing, or delaying by means not including but not limited including but not limited to the provision or use of information, statistics, studies, or analyses. And the definition of a designated employee, section 82019A3, uh, includes people making or participating in making decisions, which may have a material effect on any financial interest, which, again, I'm not a lawyer, but in my opinion, would include these interns going out, providing studies on these powers that your agency has coming back to the district and the agency acting upon those studies. Yeah, I, 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 I hear what you're saying and I'll just respond to that, which we don't have to respond for public comment, but I don't think we would be acting directly on an intern's report. They're just out there helping us do some legwork on you know what that services is informing the board of directors and the board of directors would be making that decision and mm -hmm. well and we, yeah. we this is yeah. a debate and, and, and it doesn't I, need to I be won't a respond debate. but I'll also say that the one thing that wasn't included in that is that uh, decision making as defined in that section of code also has something called substantive review and whether or not the board is providing substantive review to a presentation or a document that is being prepared right. for the board's review um, as opposed to um, say something like if, uh, if, if, if an employee of the county uh, created a staff report and then it went to uh, administrative agenda and the board approved it in consent calendar um, and so I think that there's I think there's a little bit of difference in terms of this would be an educational project is how I'm envisioning this. I, I, in terms I, I, told, yeah, I, I would agree. An educational project for everyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Certainly, definitely. Um, and I mean this is, they would be providing us with some of, some, some of their ideas on how it could be done. Right. But it's in no way acting as, as staff. So then after that, let's say we're going to study these projects. Can we really give the interns a great experience mm -hmm. and can we manage that many projects at once and it, is it a good idea to expand that over the summer and into the fall? I mean, that's... I don't know how it's currently working and how we do that assessment, but um, 
if, if we, the two of us, think that's a good work plan to take back to the full board, then we could do that. Mm -hmm. And then it's up to the full board to say, hey, can we really handle this and is this a great set of projects? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I, I would say one of the, the big questions that I have is, is, is how many we take on, especially over the summer right. months. Um, this year, in the spring quarter, I mean, we obviously I think there is a lot of interest in this internship program. Application was open for a right. week, and we got 40 plus applicants, of which the political and science department I think they described something like 25 of them as highly qualified, um, and that shows me that there is that interest. So I think that even if you're talking about over the summer, we're not going to have a huge problem in terms of getting people interested in the program. Right. What I'm concerned about is being able to stay on top of that. The number I think that we had had before was we had had I think I, the number of 10 got tossed around. Yeah. And we don't have 10 directors. Yeah. Um, so, so as, a, as a compromise, should we shoot from three to five for the summer and consider 10 potentially 10 in the winter and hold off on Santa Barbara Community College until the fall, because we probably have a hard time getting a program going up at SBCC during the, during the summer. What do, what do you think? I, I, I think that that would be a good idea okay. um, in terms of the scope. And I, I think that for, for this, I think there needs to be, um, we're talking about a work plan, I think we need to bring a document uh, to the board on this. Right. I really want to make sure that we, we don't just have a conversation and then vote on an MOU again right. because I think that that wasn't really that helpful to the board or to the public with the way that that was brought last time and right. I understand the reasons why but I think that we need to have all this stuff delineated. Yep. So I'd be happy to work on cool. preparing uh, a project proposal for the summer months Okay, so I'll make a motion that we um, continue item five <coughs> and have Director Brandt bring back a draft of a work plan at the next, um, either at, at one of the next regularly scheduled formation committee meetings before we take it to the full board. I can invite George back in, or we can uh, open let's, it for let's, vote, let's uh, vote on this first. Uh, I'm going to read it back. Um, the motion is to continue item five, um, and all seconds, by the way. Ed, can I amend this motion yep. to say to um, uh, bring back item five? Yep. At a future, at a future meeting of the formation committee. Yeah. And have Director Brandt bring back a draft of a work plan. Uh, can I amend that to say uh, for an internship program? Yes. At one of the next regularly scheduled formation committee meetings before we take it to the full board. Good. Uh, public comment? I see none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> to item six. Uh, this is to receive an update on assignment of Treasury Accounting Fund Number 3480 and title IV Community Service District dash general fund limited to 30 characters. Review procedures for making deposits to the county treasury. Discuss having the district board assign a district board member as a finance officer to work with Director Geis, assistant finance officer to do some basic accounting such as making treasury deposits, setting up the chart of account 
formatting a draft budget and other future finance duties. Um, see section uh, government code 61052. So on this item, we already um, set up the county treasury as the depository. So one of those um, things when you set up a depository is the first thing you got to get is a, a fund number and the county has assigned 3480 as the fund number. And then we needed to put a title on the financial reports that will come out of there. And um, we put IV Community Services District Dash General Fund because you're limited to 30 characters. And uh, so that's been set up. And then I have a, a second item about um, reviewing procedures um, uh, to make deposits. And so I've copied a, a couple of things out of the code. And one is, the one good thing about the uh, using the treasury and the financial system is there is a set of policies and procedures that are in place. It's 67 pages long about how to run an accounting system. One of those procedures is how to make a deposit. And, you know, the deposit starts with, we can get bank deposit slips here locally. You can take them over to the B of A. Is there a B of A here? You can deposit it at the B of A. Then you have to fill out what they call a treasurer's deposit slip. That has to go to the treasurer where they book that through their system and then they match it against the branch deposits. On the other side of the fence there, you can use the auditor system to make out what they call a uh, deposit journal entry and that records that deposit on the accounting side if you use both services. You know, it's kind of good, it's in writing. One of the things in, when you read that guideline on a treasury deposit, it talks about having two people involved in the deposit. Somebody makes the deposit, the other person's recording the treasury service. They also have three part treasury tickets, one that you could give the customer, and then they have a three part deposit ticket that you can distribute around to say, hey, you made the deposit, I'm doing the accounting entry, and, the, and, and it ties them together. So that's just an update. Um, Are we and, ready to receive money? If, a, if we received a check to the IV CSD next week, could we process it? We, I would say we could process it with one thing missing. When we did the, um, the deposit procedure or the um, acceptance of the donation, mm -hmm. and I was thinking maybe Spencer, you could help us with this with a logo. If we took that uh, little county deposit ticket, you know, that, that to make it the exchange between whoever's going to give a donation. Oh, you're saying we need a receipt? Yeah, just that receipt that for the donation program. If you could do that and put our letterhead on there in the same form as the county, then I, we could do that on a one-page piece of paper. So whoever the donor was had an official record along right. with a copy of their check yeah. that they made a Right. A yeah, and that deposit. is something that's required by our policies. Yeah. Is so you, so I just was thinking if it was a graphic designer, maybe you could help do that deposit. Oh, too. yeah, that is exactly okay. Um, and it, no, so I accepted that. Yeah. So as a graphic designer. So we're almost ready. The treasurer is ordering the deposit yeah. tickets for me. Okay. And the auditor can give us a receipt book if we want to have a separate receipt book. There's a few little tricks at the. Okay. How do we disperse the money then? The money would get deposited into the county treasury. And then how do we disperse that? How do we make payments from that? Then account? you make a request. Well, there's a couple of things to make that discussion. So I think we should discuss how to make disbursements in yeah. number seven. Okay. So okay. all this is is just setting up for an acceptance and it's an information only item for number six. Is okay. that, that good? Yeah. There's I no think. action to take. Yeah, I don't think unless we want to make a recommendation, we want to take the action to make a recommendation to the board of directors, full board that they appoint one of the officers to the, be the finance officer. I, I could be that. My preference is, the way, way I wrote this is, I'd rather train a different director that they become familiar with the county's accounting processes and that two people be part of that. And I could be the 
kind of the assistant control. director. You're and I could control. be actually the person that initiates the transactions for approval by a different board of director. Okay. They wouldn't have to do the initiation. And then maybe after six months or so, we might want to switch positions so that they understand the other side and someone knows how to drive the account. Don't we just give them a week off? <laughs> yeah. Don't we just have them yeah. go automatically take a week off? Yeah. Don't we do that with well, tell here's, Right. Here's where we get into the city situation, which is that we are a Brown Act body that is tasked with working on these things, and thus we can't communicate with one another outside of the meeting. And we are three people, and adding another one to that would be four, and that isn't legal. Whoops. So I'm just concerned about how, because, I mean, it, it seems very obvious to me that this is something that's necessary, but given the structure of the committee system, I don't know how that would work. How, how, how about if, if, like, Natalie was the finance director and I was the... That's just you're talking to four people about financial things now. Well, who's the four I'm talking to? When we do a deposit, we wouldn't be talking. Yeah. We'd only be talking with two. That's right. And we do accounting transaction, we'd only be talking with two. And then we come. I, 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 yeah. I maybe we just need to lower or lessen the scope of jurisdiction of this committee. I, I just. Well, this committee's not going to not going to look at depositing checks, nor is it going to look at disbursements. Those are the, mm -hmm. the you're going to have two board members, your finance director and your control point, who are going to handle all those and they're never going to talk to me about them unless it's mm -hmm. in the full the, board. The way that the board of directors would be informed is when we brought a financial report back to the board, they could, they, we could have the activity. But I don't think that's part of our jurisdiction anyway. I think it, I think that we're just talking about setting up the format. When the act, when we actually begin to do the actions, that's going to be a full board. Mm -hmm. I mean, somebody's got to do the transactions. Oh yeah, I know. I, and I, I, I agree. And, it, and and the the system requires it to be. Well, you can do a deposit with one person doing the transaction. If you uh, if we opt for the auditor accounting, then it's a two party. Then it's two parties have to do that. Eventually, if we got a general manager, I would rather see the general manager step in and yeah. act as the finance officer. Yeah, right. No, I agree. I agree. So I'll make a motion that we um, uh, uh, recommend to the board that they appoint a finance officer and a what, what's the title of the second person i said an assistant finance officer but an we could say finance. controller you know but a controller we don't want to wonderful that sounds so good on a business card <laughs> i'm the i'm the district's controller <laughs> and that's more the title you use for somebody that's doing the accounting side so what was the end of that motion george the motion is that we recommend to the board that they appoint a <coughs> finance officer and a controller. And how would we, a friendly amendment would be, how do we make sure that they're, um, I, I want to say compatible for... Um, well, actually, if they hate each other's guts, that's usually <laughs> a good control. Yeah, <laughs> it, it would just be that there, there would only be you know, a couple of combinations if it was with me. There could be other combinations. It just has to be people that don't sit on the same committees or have other conflicting committee assignments. Well, well if it's I'm two people that don't sit on the same committees, they can still talk to each other about stuff. They just can't talk to each other about stuff that's within the jurisdiction of their committee. Right. So I'm happy if the if your friendly amendment is to actually name that we that Natalie Jordan be the that we recommend that Natalie be the finance officer and that Bob be the controller. That just makes it easier yeah. on them. We just have to make sure at the meeting that Natalie wants to accept that assignment because. It also authorizes 
the directors to access online the county's FIN system. And they're only going to let one person go in there. Two at, time. Two, two at most. They're, they don't open it up that all board of directors can go in there and because it's a not an internet driven system, it's an intranet driven system and so you're inside the the firewalls. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to read back the motion with the amendments. Uh, the, the motion is to recommend to the board that they appoint a finance officer and a controller and that Director Jordan be the finance officer and Director Geis be the controller. Yeah, so the only thing that I would say is that if, and we'll talk about this I think at the full board when this comes up, but once once appointments, once the positions are created and appointments are made to them, the people in those positions can't come to a committee, like our committee meeting, and then talk about what they're doing. And I understand what you're saying. These are transactional things. You're not going to bring us a report of like these are the transactions they made. It's just that I just want to make that clear because we continue to have people, members of the public, who are concerned about these Brown Act issues. Yeah, I got it. And I just want to be careful about it. And I, your due care is taken because I'm, I'm a rookie at this Brown Act stuff. Mm -hmm. That's not the way I've ever operated yeah. in my career, but I get it. Yeah. Okay. So that was a motion. Made and now that you brought that up, let me think that through some more. <laughs> it's transactions. I mean, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm going to second that motion. We're, it's it's more complicated because we don't have staff. I know. Yeah. I know. If we had staff. Uh, any public comment? Seeing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. <clears throat> so the next item is discuss accounting services for the district, review the draft memorandum of agreement between the IBCSD and county auditor to the board of directors, see government code section 61052. So I did some more investigation about, you know, we, we, have, we have a couple of, two options probably. One is to use the County of Santa Barbara. The, the positives there are, we have a 67 page operating manual. There's probably 15 other special districts that are special district operating funds. So we have a model, other model districts to go operate under. Um, it's a really, has a lot of internal controls in the system that balance the needs of the treasury and the accounting side. Um, and I went back to them and said, look, we don't have any money. Can we, what's, what's the cheapest we can do these services? And so the county operates this thing called the cost allocation plan. It's based on the real cost of services. What's a transaction cost? Do they provide you with specialty accounting or things of that nature? We looked around and said for a starting district, their estimate is $500 a year. Be $50 for the first month. And then, from that point forward, this cost plan has this two-year rolling average. It'll measure your actual cost. And if you use more than that, in the third year, your cost would reflect what the two years prior, or two years ago, actual costs were. So you could end up by paying for services in the third year that you incurred in the first. That's just the way the system works. Mm -hmm. In the third year under this proposed agreement, it would adjust to actual. You'd then go and pay actual costs and it would keep rolling forward. So this is essentially the 500 is like a, it's 500 per year for the first two years. Yes. So and then the third year, it's most likely going to bump up. Yeah, and they have this roll forward in there that can really catch you. Mm -hmm. That if you're really using their services heavy, and you use more than their services, you can end up with a big bill in the third year that reflects these excess services in the past. So one Which, of the things we need to be really careful of mm -hmm. is to limit whoever the finance officer and the controller are, is to really be efficient in how we record these services and don't try and set this thing up really fancy. 
Mm-hmm. With, they have this thing called POPA, Program, Organization, Project, Activity, and Area. So you can take every transaction and you can record it down to these detail levels that relate to detailed budgets and it's how the county works. I don't think we need to do any of that. We just need basic budgetary control and keep the transactions really clean and try and not overuse the system. Mm-hmm. If, if it comes out less, and I looked at a district that was like Providence Landing, which is a park district up north, they only incur $200 a year. So we would get a credit on the roll forward if we spend less than the 500. Okay. So the other alternative is to just simply go to QuickBooks. And that means somebody, we buy the program, it's $500 a year, and we have someone invent all the policies and procedures that go along with making deposits and making withdrawals and probably setting up what I would call a separate revolving account that I think is allowed by the code. And that revolving account would be taking money out of the treasury, putting it into a separate bank account on a revolving basis, making expenditures, and then you reimburse it from the treasury. So you can do it that way, and some districts do that. And some districts, as they get sophisticated in delivery of their service, finds that that's more efficient for them when the auditor gets too expensive. But I think from the beginning, I just have this gut reaction to know that I think we should elect that we should we should take the auditor up on their um, proposal on this five hundred dollars a year. Yeah, you said their accounting policies are sixty-seven pages. Yeah, real simple. I, 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 yeah, I don't I don't think we want to forward sixty-seven pages of policy to write on how the accounting process is going to be into the policy. No, all I did is hand it out. On top of that, have you guys buy QuickBooks for the same essential initial price that we would be paying the county to do these? Yeah, these things. So, so I handed out the table of contents about the FIN accounting system. I went and read the deposit procedure, and I go, oh, I hadn't read that in years. Somebody did a really good job of writing that deposit procedure. Um, I don't know if I handed so, that. So what about when we go to spend? So when you go to spend. So we're going to so rent this office over here. Right. And we're going to make a payment to the county right. for X number of dollars. How does that occur? We can simply do that one of two ways. Um, We can generate a electronic ACH transaction, ship it to the county. We can generate a warrant and then have the county deposit it. In the case of two government entities working together, we can do a, a journal entry and actually just transfer the money from the special district fund to the county's fund, which is the most efficient way to do that transaction. Okay. So and, it's, and it's online. Okay. So um, are we, at, as we sit here right now, are we set up with the county to do that? Or do we not, need- not to do the special district operating fund. If we elect to do the special district operating fund, then we can do all those other electronic transactions. Okay. So Otherwise, if you were not a special district operating fund, you would either be doing electronic transfers to a revolving account before you made the expenditure, or you would be doing uh, drawing a warrant and paying a vendor. Right. It's just a. It's just a. And you don't have a chart of accounts, and you don't have budgetary accounts, and that type of thing. You know, the county's account has a budgetary account and then it has an accounting account and it's it's pretty efficient. So let me make a motion that we use the county of Santa Barbara for and what's what's the technical definition of what we're asking the county of Santa Barbara to provide financial and accounting services. Yeah. To provide us to provide the district with fun uh, uh, let me back up. But this is a recommendation to the board that to we enter into an agreement to provide financial and accounting services for the with, district with Thank the audit controller, yeah. Thank you. So I'll make that motion. Uh, 
I'll second HUD. George's motion is to rec recommend to the board that we enter into an agreement to provide financial and accounting services to the district. An agreement with, with the county. Of county of Santa Barbara. I think I think we need to get going on this. Right. I think we're going to start to have money coming. Yeah, I think this looks really good. Good. Um, yeah, I'm ready to go. And, and then, and then, Director Geitz is re ready to make a charitable contribution to the um, district, also. So when we get those slips, we'll bring the slips back. To the board. We're gonna have like the usual board where it's 100% board participation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know That's about true. those poor college students, but. <laughs> <laughs> Any amount, any amount is fine. <laughs> so we say. Okay. Go to the public. 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 Yeah. Do public comment. Okay. Call for the motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Oh, we good on time. We're good. We got uh, 20 minutes. 20 minutes. You wanted us out of here by noon, didn't you? I do. The no, the lunch whistle. Yeah, mm -hmm. I got my lunch book in. Gotta go. Uh, number eight is to begin the discussion of a process to adopt a budget for the remainder of fiscal year 16 17 and a budget for fiscal year 17 18 and future budget cycles. See government code section 61110 to 61119. So, quick discussion. I think Will uh, just got done saying we need to adopt a budget. On or before July 1st? On or before July 1st. Mm -hmm. So so we're going to operate on fiscal years. Depends yeah. on how you guys want to do it. Um, there's a every two year one, or there's an annual mm -hmm. um, as listed in the code. But, Does it, but are they all starting July 1? Or are some the of them September 1? Like a proposal for a budget, and then it goes review and then you have to hold a public comment period right. um, and then it has to be fully adopted by September. Yeah, they're all fiscal year. Yeah. All of them are fiscal year. Yeah. Except the federal government. Except the federal government starts in September. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, so what what do you think a budget process should look like at a special district? Because I've watched the way the county does it and they've got their process passed probably about six plus months in right. total, yeah. which is half the year. So, but what what do you think that our process should look like, um, especially given that we're working with limited resources to use the understatement of the century? Yeah, a lot of other small special districts, they start off with a, you know, finance committee that you know, the general manager works with the finance committee to put together the initial draft budget, and then that goes through their little process and then gets forwarded to the full board. Um, we run into this same old problem having a finance committee, you know, can you, do we really want an ad hoc finance committee or, you know, it, 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 you get to that same circular argument, it's not ad hoc if it's there every year, then it becomes a Brown Act Finance Committee, and it's very difficult to get that work done on the budget. Although, you know, I would say that um, our budget is like a shot in the dark. We could do it in probably uh, a half hour here of saying, okay, our budget for the next year is going to be $50,000. We're going to spend it on rent. We're going to spend it on a stipend for a general manager, a stipend for legal counsel, insurance, copying and, uh, you know, preparation of agenda costs and utilities if they charge you utilities as part of this. Um, you know, you might have a little bit in there for member travel. I mean, just so that if we're, 
I, I mean, it's it's hard to get members to, you know, go represent this district if there's no, you know, they got to buy all their own plane tickets and stuff. And so I think those are the things, you know, I'm, I can think of 10 accounts on the, uh, in terms of doing a budget. Now, if somebody comes along with a million dollars endowment, then we're talking a different game. I just don't know if that's our expectation for the next year, but you can adopt an initial budget and then, you know, with a four-fifths vote of the board, you generally can, inside the budget, budget process, it's gonna be uh, four-sevenths of a vote. Do we need a four-fifths? Generally. Can't we pass a budget with a more simple gen majority? Generally, under the County Government Act, during the budget process, it's a majority vote. So four of seven, right? Okay. Outside the budget process, when you get to the next year, then depending on the item and the way you're changing the budget, it can be a, a super majority vote. So we need to really go over as part of the budget process, we need to go into the um, community services district law and say, right. does that have a budget section that tells you how to adopt the budget section? And if it doesn't, it usually kicks over to the uh, California Government Code and the County Budget Act. So some districts, let me, mm -hmm. like Air Pollution Control District, right. they their uh, legal code for the Air Pollution Control District is not specific enough on their budget and therefore the County Budget Act guides. If you get out to some other special districts like some of the fire protection districts, they actually have a more a budgetary, how the budget works, and that can be different than the County Budget Act. So it seems to me that this is something that we should send to the policy committee. On how to adopt a budget. Mm -hmm. well, so my motion would be we recommend to the policy committee that they uh, come up with a policy for budget approvals. Okay, let me write that down. <coughs> Seems like that's more of a policy. Uh, so the motion by George and I'll second is to recommend to the policy committee that they draft a policy regarding budget approvals. Regarding adoption of a budget, the process to adopt the budget. Which when you adopt the budget, it does require a notice public hearing, mm -hmm. I think maybe two mm -hmm. weeks in advance if the document has to be published and Mm -hmm. And great. then there's the question of, do we really need to adopt a budget for this year and record some minor transactions to properly complete, you know, our financial activities for the current year? You know, I know, I think, I think Jay made a point before, you know, he's contributing a significant amount of, you know, in-kind services. So should we be issuing a donation transaction to him and recording those on the books, even if it's only a couple thousand dollars, it would show that response, you know, how we're, how we're accomplishing that. And we'll have some probably donations and then we might have some money coming in from, um, from the mediation, not the mediation, but the, um, what do you call it? You just corrected me before. The Municipal Advisory yeah, Council. Yeah, the Municipal Advisory Council where Supervisor uh, Hartman has some money um, to fund that program. I don't know if she has it this year and next year, but I know she has some for this year that she's kind of um, set aside. Now normally to get that money out of the county you need to incur expenditures, but I think in in that supervisory account they treat those as a little bit of grants that they could that they could get move that over to us. 
Mm -hmm. So you're saying you're not even sure if we need to adopt a 17, 18 budget? Well, how about if we finish no, this? No, I think, no, no, I th you have to adopt a 17, Yeah, that's because, okay. And I'm I sorry, think you might have to that? adopt a 16, yeah. 17 budget. Yeah. I oh. think so too. Okay. I agree. Yeah. Let's do, let's deal with the motion first. Okay. Do you want to go to the public? And yeah, any public comment? I mean, my only comment is it would be easier if I just whip this together, but I, I don't think that's the right way to do it. I think it, you, I should stop trying to whip stuff together no, and let no. people, they, you, you they, whip, actually, you they actually needed to learn. But then I can't come to the policy committee and participate, right? No. Okay, cool. I, Jonathan? Yeah, I have one public comment about the ad hoc uh, finance committee or not. I know IABRB has a finance committee that's the Brown Act committee, but they only meet as needed, so. You they only meet as needed, yeah. Yeah, you don't have to worry about having like, do they? Do you know if they put, or, they take their budget process through their finance committee? They do. Yeah. yeah so that's the model we can So I have a, I'm, I'm going to have a follow-up motion on that. Is that an ad hoc committee or a regular? The finance? Yeah. It's a right. regular Brown Act committee, committee yeah. yeah. But they only meet like three times a year. Right. Mm -hmm. But they, do you, they don't have a regular meeting schedule? They don't. I was on it. They don't have a regular meeting schedule. Okay. Yeah, so maybe like we would want, like, can we can we do this motion? You guys are yeah yeah. You guys yeah. are talking. We got to get out of here. Yeah yeah. Because yeah. I'm going to make another motion. That's a okay. call for the question. Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So my next motion is I want to I want to recommend to the board of the board the board of directors that we form a finance committee that they be tasked with putting together a budget for the current fiscal year and for the future fiscal year. And the direction we give them is that um, they look at the um, grant from the university. I'll second that. And that would be a Brown Act committee. I mean, I think that's what the way we got to right. go. But that's a good suggestion in terms of it doesn't have to meet once it does the budget, it doesn't have to meet anymore. Right. It could just have the role of being part of the annual budget process, and you could limit it to that. Yeah. Yeah. In a lot of um, in a lot of uh, districts, they meet twice a year. They meet number one to discuss the budget and plan for the budget, and then they meet one more time to review the draft of the proposed budget before it goes to the board. Is that a motion? That we only meet twice a year? Well, I'll, I'll, I think we can, once we form the finance yeah, committee. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll read back the, the motion. <laughs> the motion is that we recommend to the board of directors that we form a finance committee to be tasked with drafting a budget for the current and next fiscal year, and that we direct them to consider the grant from the university. And the uh, first was George, uh, and I will second. Yeah, so Any I, public comment? Go ahead. You previously directed the policy committee to look into the budgetary process. Is that a concurrent thing that's going on now? There's the process, and then there's the fulfillment yeah. of the process, I would imagine. I could see, like, the policy committee uh, taking up, well, do we want a annual or do we want a biannual? Yeah. Well, so I, I sent it there because I want them to decide what requires a majority vote and what's going to require a supermajority yeah. vote. Yeah, got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you got to understand that before you go into the process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and how that supermajority, like, in the County Budget Act, if you want to do a fixed asset purchases outside the regular budget process, that's definitely a super majority vote. That mm -hmm. means you're buying a big asset. Mm -hmm. It's kind of archaic what they do, but you know you also have abilities without a super majority vote to move money around within the object levels. But mm -hmm. but once you go outside those, you right. require a super majority. Yeah, under the County Budget Act okay. for. 
a certain, a couple of other things, I'd have to do a little bit of work to refresh myself. Anyways, call for the question. We good? Aye. Yeah. Aye. 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 All right. Uh, how about if we, in the shortness of time, we can, we do not do nine. item nine. I agree. We'll yeah. skip that and just keep it for future yeah. discussion. And then number 10, I think it's kind of important that we discuss the formation committee director's availability for scheduled regular meeting dates of every first and third Friday at 10, 970 Embarcadero Del Mar. Discuss meeting room availability. Consider the cancellation of certain regular meetings. Consider setting special meetings. So how do we think the schedule, the bi-weekly schedule is working? So I think that I, as formation chair, um, was not very attuned to the 72-hour rule and realized at the last board of directors meeting that I hadn't set out that agenda in time. Mm -hmm. And uh, Gabriel's pointing that out in his letter that, hey, you didn't get the agendas out in time. We couldn't even consider the last two regularly scheduled meeting, we had to cancel them and redo them as special meetings. So I don't think there's anything wrong with that process if we can't get an agenda out. But if we don't get an agenda out, that means we've got to follow with that meeting cancellation and scheduling mm -hmm. another meeting. The one thing that was confusing me is I always wanted to take direction from the full board and say, oh, we'll put that on the agenda. Yeah, no, I agree. So, you know, I, that confused me, but then I said to myself, well, if the board tells us to put something on the full agenda of the formation committee, that's only three days anyways, and yes, we can write it up. It doesn't give us any time to get it on there, but is that important, or should we be really straggling that out to have the ability to do some work on the referral prior to us considering it at the formation committee? And so I, I, you know, we could do a meeting on them, change our regular meeting to Monday, and then we could have enough time, but that would only give one day to get the agenda out, right? Or if you consider, do we consider Saturday and Sunday part of the 72-hour notice? Yeah, the, the law certainly does. Oh, so that was yeah. confusing me too. So that means that would give us out for a Monday meeting, we'd have to have the agenda out on Thursday, mm -hmm. which would give us two days to turn around a formation agenda yeah. if the board wanted us to consider something. Yeah. So. Well, and that's worked in the past for this committee, and it's worked in the past for the policy committee as well. I think Mondays are a fine amount of time for us to get an agenda out. Do you think that's feasible for you? Uh, it's more motivating for me. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, we, I mean, we could also do I mean, Tuesdays it's or Wednesdays. Like, when are, when are we free? If, if we're looking at revising the regular meeting date, then we can go and, and look into that. Um, because, I mean, I, I think that's certainly something we need to do. I know my Tuesdays are normally, well, they're, yeah, this quarter my Tuesdays are not that great. Okay. Um, I, I mean... You know, coming coming off of a, a regular board meeting with some notes on what the board wants us to consider at formation, it's easier for me, you know, if it's the next day, yeah. I'm, I'm fresh around what the agenda item is mm -hmm. and, you know, I'm starting to pick up, you know, the ideas of, well, we can have repetitive items on the agenda as long as we notice and say we can talk about them. I think I'm in the learning process on how to better um, create a mm -hmm. Brown Act committee agenda. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a rookie, <laughs> and so um, and so. I, you know, more time would be better. I, uh, I I think Fridays would work to help us get at some of these longer term issues, mm -hmm. um, and they give you. It also just gives the committee less flexibility, though, which is what the concern. Yeah. What do you think? Do you want to change to Mondays? You know what? This is one of those ones where I, I, it's totally up to you two. I, I, I I'm going to have a Mondays. tendency occasionally to not make Friday meetings. I'm more likely to make a Monday meeting, but I think it's up to you two. Whatever you guys decide, I'll go with. 
I think in the long <coughs> run, I have, would have a tendency to better make and get an agenda out for a Monday meeting than for a Friday meeting too. Mm -hmm. So okay. if it all works for a better cadence for getting out the agendas, um, then I think we should change our, I'll make a motion that we change our regularly scheduled meeting to the first and third Monday. What time was that? Is that the right first and third Monday or is it second, second, and and second and fourth Monday? At 10 a.m. Yeah, well, well, yeah. yeah. 970 in Barcadero, Del Mar. Ten o'clock in the morning. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the motion is that we change our regularly scheduled <coughs> meeting to the second and fourth Monday at ten a.m. in nine seventy in Barcadero, in Barcadero Del Mar. I'll second that. <coughs> uh, we have a couple of public comments. Nope. Nope. Okay. No public comment. Would the next meeting be the 22nd then? That's the fourth Would that go into effect for the next meeting? Yes. Okay. Yes, it would. And how about that regular meeting that we canceled? And uh, didn't we cancel? It was one on Friday, yes. One regular meeting on a Friday and rescheduled it as a special meeting? A while back, we did, yes. Yeah. Do we still want to hold that meeting? No, this is a regular meeting schedule. We only get one regular meeting. So this overwrites what we previously did. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so that regular meeting that we canceled and rescheduled because we couldn't get the room? That's a one-time thing. If you, you can we, cancel a regular meeting all you want, and if you want to reschedule something, it has to be a special meeting. Yeah, yeah, I got it. Mm -hmm. I, I follow in those rules. Okay. All right, we'll call for the question. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I guess my question was, we had already canceled the regular meeting and rescheduled the special meeting. Do we still want to hold that special meeting? And I forget which date it is. It's the 19th at 2. 19th at 2. That was my question, too. Because there's the next meeting to be two days later, three days later. What was the reason that we had, oh, you know what? It was what? a meeting room time. Yeah, well, let me go back and look at that email. Um, you see what exactly it is. Um, we had we had sched we had rescheduled the meeting that was on the nineteenth at two. We we rescheduled the ten o'clock to the two o'clock. That's right. But if we're now gonna have a regular And we meeting. had scheduled a meeting for yeah, okay. Well, yeah, in that case, well, I move that we cancel the special meeting scheduled for May 19th at 2 p.m. Second. Any public comment? All in favor? Aye. Aye. So then, um, suggestions of items for the next formation committee meeting, and that's going to be held on the... 22nd of May, is that, that correct? Is that what Jonathan <coughs> just told us? What's that? Is that what Jonathan just told us? May 22nd? May 22nd. So, fourth? Yes, Monday. It, would be, it would be May 22nd at 10 a.m. Um, and I'm going to reach out to Rodney and make sure the room is available then. I don't see why it wouldn't be at 10 a.m. on a Monday. Okay. But, um, if I find out that it's not, then I'll let you know at the next board meeting. Um, and let's see, in terms of future agenda items, um, well, I think there's some things we just need to bring back. Uh, one of them being the internship work plan. Um, let's see what else we need to bring back. We're going to continue the discussion of fundraising. Yep. And um, and I think we should keep one. We'll keep one on there just for you able to give us updates. Yeah. Will help us out. So two's done, three's done. Um, 
I'm bringing back number four. Am I bringing back a presentation from Alliant, or we're trying to schedule that to the regular board meeting, right? We're trying to schedule yeah. it for the regular board meeting. Um, <coughs> but, I mean, if you find out that that's not feasible and need to bring it back, I mean, you can put items on the agenda at okay. discretion, and then I imagine we're going to get stuff forwarded to it at the next board meeting, too. Okay. <coughs> And then I have a question. Does the board want to take up these um, letters from Gabriel as a regular agenda item? And a regular agenda item for what? The board? Or you're asking the board or you're asking this committee? I think we're asking this committee because um, Gabriel's suggesting that we, as the formation committee, complete these unconditional commitments, or whatever they're called. Well, I'll say the letter is addressed to, to you. I don't know if that is, I don't know if that is how the process works, but maybe you should look into the code and have an agenda item for a response. Yeah. I did look at the code. Okay. That sounds great. Like all code, it's vague, but <laughs> I get it. That's the truth. All right. Anything else for the good of the order? We good making man. progress? Great. Right? Great. Yeah. Right on. So we're fine. Right. 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 Started right. exactly two after. All right. Cool. Good job. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.